Okay, hello, this is video lecture number 94. Today we are talking about the war in Vietnam, uh, the years 1963 to 1968. Our subsections today are escalation under Johnson, public opinion in the war, and rise of the student movement. So the United States' uh, failure to secure the independence of South Vietnam uh, a, creation, uh, a creation of the Franco-Vietnam War uh, was a costly and divisive experience. The Vietnam War, or American War as it was known in Vietnam, along with racial conflict and disorder and violence in black neighborhoods, on campuses, and outside the 1968 National Convention in Chicago, to all of which the war contributed, um, was central to the coming apart of the nation and the dissolving of the liberal consensus during the mid and late 1960s. The United States had a long history of involvement in Vietnam by the time Lyndon Johnson became president. As early as the Truman administration, uh, the United States began helping to underwrite France's efforts to reclaim its pre-war empire in Indochina. U.S. Cold War strategy and France's colonial designs converged. Uh, since Vietnam's nationalist movement was communist-led. U.S. aid to France increased during the Korean War, uh, but following the humiliating defeat of French forces at Dien Bien Phu in 1954, Vietnam was divided along the 17th parallel into a communist North and a non-communist South Vietnam. Reunification of the country was to follow free elections set for 1956. But the Eisenhower administration committed the U.S. to a non-communist South Vietnam under Diem, a corrupt and increasingly unpopular leader. Elections were never held, uh, and the United States, which had supplanted France, sent aid and military advisors to Saigon in the South uh, to shore up its new but weak ally in the Cold War. The situation was difficult but stable until 1959 when Hanoi faithfully decided to renew its push for national reunification by supporting armed resistance in the South to Diem's incompetent regime. In response to this growing civil conflict, the Kennedy administration increased America's commitment to South Vietnam uh, with U.S. military advisors suffering casualties in the field. Uh, but Diem's regime was unsuccessful in its war against the National Liberation Front, the NLF, or the Viet Cong and its North Vietnamese backers. So it was that the United States agreed to the South Vietnamese Army coup that deposed and murdered Diem just weeks, as it turned out, before the assassination of President Kennedy. The change in leadership in Saigon, however, did little to help change the military situation on the ground, and Vietnam's violent reunification looked increasingly likely as Lyndon Johnson became president. Faced with the stark choice, then, of presiding over the loss of South Vietnam to communism or deepening the U.S. military involvement in the region in order to thwart unification, uh, President Johnson faithfully cho chose uh, the latter. Let's have a closer look. The war in Vietnam from 63 to 68, starting with escalation under Johnson. When Johnson became president, he continued and accelerated U.S. involvement in Vietnam based on the policy of containing communism. Johnson, in the summer of 1964, heard reports that North Vietnamese torpedo boats had fired on American destroyers in international waters. On August 7, 1964, Congress authorized the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which allowed Johnson to take all necessary measures to repel any armed attack against the forces of the United States and to prevent further aggression. The Johnson administration moved toward the Americanization of the war with Operation Rolling Thunder, a protracted bombing campaign that, by 1968, had dropped a million tons of bombs on North Vietnam. Operation Rolling Thunder intensified the North Vietnamese's will to fight. Uh, the flow of their troops and supplies continued to the south unabated as the communists rebuilt roads and bridges, 
moved munitions underground and built networks of tunnels and shelters. Simultaneously with the launch of Operation Rolling Thunder, the United States sent its first ground troops into combat in 1965. By 66, more than 380,000 American soldiers were in Vietnam. By 68, 536,000 American soldiers were stationed in Vietnam. Now, hoping to win a war of attrition, the Johnson administration assumed that American superiority in personnel and weaponry would ultimately triumph. Let's go to the next section, public opinion and the war. By the late 1960s, public opinion began to turn against the war in Vietnam. Television had much to do with these attitudes, as Vietnam was the first televised war. Despite glowing statements made on television, uh, by 1967, many administration officials privately reached a more pessimistic conclusion regarding the war. The administration was accused of suffering from a credibility gap. Uh, 1966 televised hearings by the Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, raised further questions about U.S. policy. Economic developments put Johnson and his advisors even more on the defensive. The costs of the war became evident as the growing federal deficit nudged the inflation rate upward, uh, beginning the inflationary spiral that plagued the U.S. economy throughout the 1970s. Now, after the escalation in the spring of 1965, various anti-war coalitions organized several mass demonstrations in Washington. Uh, participants shared a common skepticism about the means and aims of U.S. policy and argued that the war was antithetical uh, to American ideals. Let's go to the last section then, Rise of the Student Movement. Youth were uh, uh, among the key uh, to protests in the era. Uh, in their manifesto, the Port Huron Statement, the Students for a Democratic Society, or SDS, expressed their disillusionment with the consumer culture and the gulf between the prosperous and the poor and rejected Cold War ideology and foreign policy. The founders of SDS referred to themselves as the new left uh, to distinguish themselves from the old left of communists and socialists of the 1930s and 1940s. At the University of California at Berkeley, the free speech movement organized a sit-in in response to administrators' attempts to ban political activity on campus. Many protests centered on the draft, uh, especially after the Selective Service System abolished automatic student deferments in January 1966. Uh, in public demonstrations of civil disobedience, opponents of the war burned their draft cards closed down induction centers, and broke into selective service offices and destroyed records. Much of the university's uh, research budgets also came from Defense Department contracts, and students demanded that Reserve Officer Training Corps, ROTCs, be removed from college campuses in an overarching push against the military in colleges. Uh, the Johnson administration had to face the reality then of large-scale opposition to the war. The 1967 mobilization to end the war brought 100,000 protesters into the streets of San Francisco and over 250,000 in New York. The hippie also uh, symbolized the new counterculture. This was a youthful movement that glorified liberation from traditional social structures. Popular music by Pete Seeger, Joan Baez, and Bob Dylan expressed political idealism, protest, and loss of patience with the war, and was an important part of this counterculture. Uh, the Beatles also, with Beatlemania, uh, helped to deepen the generational divide and paved the way for the more rebellious, angrier music of other British groups, most notably the Rolling Stones. Drugs and sex intertwined with music as a crucial element of the youth culture as celebrated at rock concerts attended by hundreds of thousands of people. In 1967, at the world's first human be-in at San Francisco's Golden Gate Park, Timothy Leary urged gatherers to turn on, tune in, 
and drop out. 1967 was also the summer of love in which city neighborhoods swelled with young dropouts, drifters, and teenage runaways dubbed flower children. Now, many young people stayed out of the counterculture and anti-war uh, movements, yet media coverage made it seem that all of America's youth were rejecting political, social, and cultural norms. Okay, so that's it for today. Um, this is the beginning of our study of Vietnam. Now you'll notice that we didn't cover uh, battles and strategies of the war. That discussion is coming. Um, but like our discussions of previous wars, you'll know that in a survey course like this, you're not going to get that in-depth analysis of the war itself uh, that some of you might be interested in. You would have to take a military history course in order to get something like that. So. Again, in a survey course like this, what we're really going to focus on is how this war ultimately changed America and its effect on what was going on here at home. So again, uh, go ahead and answer your review questions at this time and uh, continue on with your notes and your work.